Book Nine, The Book of Eternal Night Canto Two, The Journey in Eternal Night and the Voice of the Darkness A while on the chill, dreadful edge of night all stood as if a world were doomed to die and waited on the eternal silence brink. Heaven leaned towards them like a cloudy brow of menace through the dim and voiceless hush. As thoughts stand mute, on a despairing verge where the last depths plunge into nothingness and the last dreams must end. They paused. In their front were glooms like shadowy wings. Behind them, pale, the lifeless evening was a dead man's gaze. Hungry beyond, the night desired her soul. But still in its lone niche of templed strength, motionless, her flame-bright spirit, mute, erect, burned like a torch-fire from a windowed room, pointing against the darkness' somber breast. The woman first affronted the abyss, daring to journey through the eternal night. Armored with light, she advanced her foot to plunge, into the dread and hueless vacancy. Immortal, unappalled, her spirit faced the danger of the ruthless, eyeless waste. Against night's inky ground they stood, molding mysterious motion on her human tread. A swimming action and a drifting march, like figures moving before eyelids closed. All as in dreams went slipping, gliding on. The rock gate's heavy walls were left behind as if through passages of receding time, present and past, into the timeless lapsed, arrested upon dim adventure's brink, the future ended, drowned in nothingness. Amid collapsing shapes, they wound obscure the fading vestibules of a tenebrous world received them where they seemed to move and yet be still nowhere advancing yet to pass a dumb procession a dim picture bound not conscious forms threading a real scene. A mystery of terror's boundlessness, gathering its hungry strength, the huge pitiless void surrounded slowly with its soundless depths and monstrous Cavernous, a shapeless throat devoured her into its shadowy strangling mass, the fierce spiritual agony 
of a dream, a curtain of impenetrable dread, the darkness hung around her cage of sense, as when the trees have turned to blotted shades and the last friendly glimmer fades away around a bullock in the forest tied by hunters closes in no empty night. The thought that strives in the world was here unmade. Its effort it renounced to live and know, convinced at last that it had never been. It perished, all its dream of action done. This clotted cipher was its dark result. In the smothering stress of this stupendous naught, mind could not think, breath could not breathe, the soul could not remember or feel itself. It seemed a hollow gulf of sterile emptiness, a zero oblivious of the sum it closed an abnegation of the maker's joy, saved by no wide repose, no depth of peace. On all that claims here to be truth and God, and conscious self and the revealing word and the creative rap of the mind and love and knowledge and heart's delight there fell the immense refusal of the eternal no as disappears a golden lamp in gloom born into distance from the eye's desire into the shadows vanished Savitri. There was no course, no path, no end or goal. Visionless she moved amid insensible gulfs, or drove through some great black unknowing waste or whirled in a dumb eddy of meeting winds assembled by the titan hands of chance. There was none with her in the dreadful vast. She saw no more the vague, tremendous God. Her eyes had lost their luminous Satyavan. Yet not for this her spirit failed, but held more deeply than the bounded senses can, which grasp externally and find to lose its object loved. So when on earth they lived, she had felt him straying through the glades, the glades as seen in her, its clefts, her being's vistas, opening their secrets to his search and joy. Because to jealous sweetness in her heart, whatever happy space his cherished feet preferred must be at once her soul embracing his body passioning dumbly to his tread. But now a silent gulf between them came, and to abysmal loneliness she fell, even from herself cast out. 
from love remote. Long hours since long it seems when sluggish time is measured by the throbs of the soul's pain in an unreal darkness empty and drear she travelled treading on the corpse of life lost in a blindness of extinguished souls solitary in the anguish of the void she lived in spite of death she conquered still in vain her puissant being was oppressed her heavy long monotony of pain tardily of its fierce self-torture tired at first a faint, inextinguishable gleam, pale but immortal, flickered in the gloom, as if a memory came to spirits dead, a memory that wished to live again, dissolved from mind in nature's natal sleep. It wandered like a lost ray of the moon, revealing to the night her soul of dread. Serpentine in the gleam, the darkness lolled, its black hoods jeweled with the mystic glow. Its dull, sleek folds shrank back and coiled and slid as though they felt all light a cruel pain and suffered from the pale approach of hope night felt assailed her heavy sombre reign the splendor of some bright eternity threatened with this faint beam of wandering truth, her empire of the everlasting naught. Implacable in her intolerant strength, and confident that she alone was true, she strove to stifle the frail, dangerous ray. Aware of an all-negating immensity, she reared her giant head of nothingness, her mouth of darkness swallowing all that is. She saw in herself the tenebrous absolute. But still the light prevailed and still it grew, and Savitri to her lost self awoke. Her limbs refused the cold embrace of death, her heart beats triumphed in the grasp of pain, her soul persisted, claiming for its joy the soul of the beloved, now seen no more. Before her, in the stillness of the world, once more she heard the treading of a god, and out of the dumb darkness, Satyavan, her husband, grew into a luminous shade. Then a sound pealed through that dead, monstrous realm, vast like the surge in a tired swimmer's ears, clamoring a fatal, iron-hearted roar, death missioned to the night his lethal call. 
This is my silent, dark immensity. This is the home of everlasting night. This is the secrecy of nothingness, entombing the vanity of life's desires. Hast thou beheld thy source, O transient heart, and known from what the dream thou art was made, in this stark sincerity of nude emptiness, hopest thou still always to last and love, the woman answered not. Her spirit refused the voice of night that knew and death that thought. In her beginningless infinity, through her soul's reaches, unconfined she gazed. She saw the undying fountains of her life. She knew herself eternal without birth. But still opposing her with endless night, death, the dire god, inflicted on her eyes the immortal calm of his tremendous gaze. Although thou hast survived the unborn void, which never shall forgive while time endures, the primal violence that fashioned thought, forcing the immobile vast to suffer and live. This sorrowful victory only hast thou won, to live for a little without Satyavan. What shall the ancient goddess give to thee who helps thy heart beats? Only she prolongs the nothing dreamed existence and delays with the labor of living thy eternal sleep. A fragile miracle of thinking clay armed with illusions walks the child of time. To fill the void around he feels and dreads, the void he came from and to which he goes. He magnifies his self and names it God. He calls the heavens to help his suffering hopes. He sees above him with a longing heart, bare spaces more unconscious than himself that have not even his privilege of mind and empty of all but their unreal blue and peoples them with bright and merciful powers. For the sea roars around him, and earth quakes beneath his steps, and fire is at his doors, and death prowls baying through the woods of life. Moved by the presences with which he yearns, he offers in implacable shrines his soul, and clothes all with the beauty of his dreams. 
The gods who watch the earth with sleepless eyes and guide its giant stumblings through the void have given to man the burden of his mind. In his unwilling heart they have lit their fires and sown in it incurable unrest. His mind is a hunter upon tracks unknown, amusing time with vain discovery, he deepens with thought the mystery of his fate and turns to song his laughter and his tears. His mortality vexing with the immortal's dreams, troubling his transience with the infinite's breath, they gave him hungers which no food can fill. He is the cattle of the shepherd gods, his body the tether with which he is tied. They cast for fodder grief and hope and joy. His pasture ground they have fenced with ignorance. Into his fragile undefended breast they have breathed a courage that is met by death. They have given a wisdom that is mocked by night. They have traced a journey that foresees no goal. Aimless man toils in an uncertain world lulled by inconstant pauses of his pain, scourged like a beast by the infinite desire, bound to the chariot of the dreadful gods. But if thou still canst hope and still wouldst love, return to thy body's shell, thy tie to earth, and with thy heart's little remnants try to live. Hope not to win back to thee, Satyavan, yet since thy strength deserves no trivial crown, gifts I can give to soothe thy wounded life. The pacts which transient beings make with fate, and the wayside sweetness earth-bound hearts would pluck, these, if thy will accepts, make freely thine. Choose a life's hopes, for thy deceiving prize. As ceased the ruthless and tremendous voice, unendingly there rose in Savitri, like moonlit ridges on a shuddering flood, a stir of thoughts out of some silence born, across the sea of her dumb, fathomless heart. At last she spoke, her voice was heard by night. I bow not to thee, O huge mask of death, black lie of night to the cowed soul of man unreal, inescapable end of things, thou grim jest played with the immortal spirit. Conscious of immortality I walk, a victor spirit conscious of my force, 
Not as a suppliant to thy gates I came. Unslain I have survived the clutch of night. My first strong grief moves not my seated mind. My unwept tears have turned to pearls of strength. I have transformed my ill-shaped brittle clay into the hardness of a statued soul. Now in the wrestling of the splendid gods my spirit shall be obstinate and strong against the vast refusal of the world. I stoop not with the subject mob of minds who run to glean with eager, satisfied hands and pick from its mire mid many trampling feet its scornful, small concessions to the weak. Mine is the labor of the battling gods. Imposing on the slow, reluctant years The flaming will that reigns beyond the stars They lay the law of mind on matter's works And win the soul's wish from earth's inconscient force First I demand whatever Satyavan, my husband, waking in the forest's charm out of his long, pure childhood's lonely dreams, desired and had not for his beautiful life. Give, if thou must, or if thou canst, refuse. Death bowed his head in scornful cold assent. The builder of this dream-like earth for man, who has mocked with vanity all gifts he gave, Uplifting his disastrous voice, he spoke, Indulgent to the dreams my touch shall break, I yield to his blind father's longing heart, Kingdom and power and friends and greatness lost, And royal trappings, for his peaceful age, the pallid pomps of man's declining days, the silvered decadent glories of life's fall. To one who wiser grew by adverse fate, goods I restore the deluded soul prefers to impersonal nothingnesses bare sublime. The sensuous solace of the light I give to eyes which could have found a larger realm, a deeper vision in their fathomless night. For that this man desired and asked in vain While still he lived on earth and cherished hope. Back from the grandeur of my perilous realms Go, mortal, to thy small permitted sphere. Hasten, swift-footed, Lest to slay thy life The great laws thou hast violated, Moved 
open at last on thee their marble eyes.